Welcome to Understanding Russia, a student-led podcast from Belgorod State University. I'm your host, Ian, and along with the staff and students at Belgorod State University, I have taken it on myself to try to explain how Russians educate their children. In this episode, we will start where they start, in preschool. In the developed world, preschool education is not a given. Depending on where you live and what income you have, kindergartens, nursery schools or creche services, and indeed childcare of most varieties, can be difficult to access, inconvenient, ideologically motivated, or just downright expensive. In some rural places, it is non-existent. You would be forgiven for thinking that Russia might be somewhat lacking. With a vast territory and a per capita income somewhat less than the norm in European countries, it would be a reasonable assumption. It is a wrong one as it turns out. Education is something Russians of all stripes take an interest in. In recent history, when a proposal came down from the government that parents contribute more to the cost of preschool care, the backlash was effective enough that a cap of 20% of the total expenditure was placed on costs that could be transferred to the parents. Combine this with the parsimony of the local authorities that run preschools, and the cost of care for young children turns out to be very low indeed. If preschool is available, parents have a right to access it. In Moscow, it can be difficult to locate preschool places that are convenient, and so a child is registered at birth in order to afford the authorities a reasonable time, usually a maximum of two years, to find an appropriate birth for the burbling infant. This allows busy Muscovites to plan ahead with confidence and frees up the workforce, one of the many benefits of preschool. Other benefits are numerous. Teachers can monitor behavior, health and nutrition, They can identify learning disabled children and have a genuine and warm relationship with most parents. There's something more intimate and trusting about care for very young children. The economic benefits of preschool are more difficult to assess, but suffice to say that during the pandemic lockdown of 2020, they were one of the services too vital to suspend, whereas schools were not. Before I go too far into the weeds on this one, let's hear what my friends Ivan and Nget could remember about their early education. I'm betting it isn't much. I can't remember much about last week, let alone being six. There aren't even many photos to remind me slash plant false memories in my head about that time. You're listening to Understanding Russia. So today's subject is preschool care. Um, We're going to hear from experts later, but before we hear from experts, let's hear from the rest. Uh, in the studio with me, we have Unget and Ivan, and we're going to talk about what we remember, if we remember anything from the time before preschool. Now, for me, that's ancient history. In those days, electricity was a new thing. Therefore, I remember next to nothing about my preschool care. And Ivan also remembers next to nothing about his preschool care. Why is that, Ivan? Well, because as you said, if for you it is ancient history, for me it's fiction because I have never been to kindergarten. Why? Well, you see, Ian, I'm not the most, as we know, cultured person, but also I'm not the world's healthiest person. So you spent your early years at home, in and out of hospitals. Well, it wasn't that dark at that time. It was before. So how did you become such an intelligent, cultured and well-mannered person? Well. That's my secret. I didn't. So you see. (laughs) But honestly, I don't think it would shape me differently if I have visited kindergarten. Would it? Why? It would socialize you. Good point. Do you think you're more social because you have visited kindergarten? How many friends do you have? Well, during my school days, I also had quite many friends. But later, when I came to the city, everyone found out that I was so uncultured and they decided to stop talking to me. So now I'm all alone. Where's my violin? Well, it's a sad story. So now we see the evidence of why preschool care is important because we have an example of someone who did go to preschool and enjoyed it and we have somebody who didn't go to preschool and enjoyed it. Well, yes, but one is sociable, the other one is not sociable. So Nguyen, tell me what you remember about your preschool. I mean, what age do you go to school in Vietnam? What time? When at do you six. start? At six. They started uh, at seven in Russia. Uh, well, I do remember partially. I have some memories, but the first thing that my mother told me about my preschool, it was when I was three years old, first went to preschool, and uh, she thought that 
I would be like other children would cry and uh, not let my mother go. But no, I went straight away. Ran away from <laughs> Ran her. Ran away from her. And you never stopped. Never and never looked back. <laughs> so your mum's in Vietnam and you're here and you started running away from her when you went to kindergarten. Sure. And she was shocked because she couldn't imagine me being so such a sociable and uh, brave kid. But the funnier thing is that at the end of the day, when she went to pick me up i didn't want to leave oh wow i cried and didn't want to leave so hold on you went to kindergarten and you left forever that was your moment of freedom and get breaks for freedom yes it was and eventually she ends up thousands of miles and hours away from her home and ivan so so you see that's the point i love my family i like good i didn't want to leave them you cling to them like some what do you mean me? i cling to them <laughs> is that because of them or because of you because you haven't moved far away from them exactly it's because i'm not so far away i can visit them at any point but why you just don't want i'm just so uncultured so they don't want to talk to me hold on if they're if you're uncultured are they uncultured no they're very cultured oh because they have went to kindergarten i'm the only one who haven't gone to kindergarten so i'm the only you're the best advert for kindergarten (laughs) in a good or in a bad sense well you tell me in a good sense. Well, you don't. You're looking at me. <laughs> well, you're looking at an advert. I mean, you're a good advert for it in the same way that an axe murderer is a good advert for the police. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we can. So, um... <laughs> it's so beautiful. It's our second podcast and abuse still hasn't stopped. Um, no, no, the abuse will never stop. I never so mean that's to. part of the amusement. So, and get. Um, oh, who's amusement? You, <laughs> the amusement will never stop. And get, do you, um, do you have any questions for Ivan about this thing? I wanted to ask whether children start learning foreign languages or uh, at the kindergarten. Because uh, now in Vietnam, they tend to teach children foreign languages from very early ages, from two or three years old, and kind of some pictures, some names of the stuff. Does it work? It really works. There is a boy, a Vietnamese boy here, a son of a couple of Vietnamese students here, and he really speaks three languages, three languages at the age of five. So Russian, Vietnamese and English? English, yeah. Counting, naming stuff, answering, what do you want to be in the future? So how old is he? Five. Oh, no, not even five. Three years old. three years old. Three years old. Well, we'll Speaking three languages. We'll see how it pans out, because when people see children do something like this they think that's extraordinary the most important thing is that it will move further from counting and saying what you want to be in the future well Well, he can move further if his parents help him and if he still has the contact with the culture and the language uh, or will Mm. Well, here's the thing. That's that's a good point because my first, my kindergarten was a kindergarten. I was in Germany from the age of three. And so my language, my first language, my language of instruction was German and my home language was English. And my German is, as my German friends will tell me, terrible. I can understand quite a lot of German, but I can't speak it. Because you're an English speaker. Well, no, because I was originally a German speaker. Don't tell my students. Until what age? Until six. Until six is nothing. Well, that's my point, right? What Ivan is saying is correct. As soon as I left that place and nobody spoke German to me, I didn't really benefit from it at all. You have to keep going because Mm -hmm. you're not conscious of anything when you're in kindergarten. But look, I left Ukraine when I was nine and I still remembered Russian because I lived in Kharkov. I still remembered Russian for two years having no contact with the language. Yeah, but you were nine. Nine. Nine, nine, Nine-ninety-three is a big gap. Like 200% gap. Yeah, thanks for the maths. Well, I'm uncultured, but I'm smart. That's true. So... Unget, do you remember anything about preschool? Do you remember where it was or what? Or just what your mum tells you? I do, except from the stuff my mum told me. I do remember the sleeping time and the teachers there. I do remember an image of a teacher. I don't really remember her, but I remember her image and how she made us eat (laughs) the soup. (laughs) So you remember traumatic things only? (laughs) And she made us sleep. (laughs) You will sleep, you will eat the soup. (laughs) That was very strict kindergarten. I think things are strict in Vietnam in general in education, is that right? 
The thing is that the part I remember happened in uh, Ukraine, not in Vietnam. I have no memories about my Vietnamese kindergarten. Wow. Very first memory is my first day in Ukraine when I was asking my father, where's my mother? Because I've never seen my father before. <laughs> All right, so you were afraid of him. Yes. Yeah. You're listening to Understanding Russia. But in Vietnam, uh, children who are sent to kindergarten, they are supposed to know all the alphabet before the first class and supposed to know how to count and to do maths, the basic maths, before going to school. And so uh, parents are even sending their children to additional classes at the age of five to learn basic maths and to learn uh, the language. That's nuts. Then what are they doing at this preschool? What are they teaching foreign languages? I mean, no, uh, you are not supposed to do maths before going to school. You're supposed to learn it in the first class, in the first grade. But children in Vietnam, well, at least five years ago, they uh, were really sent to additional classes. So you're all really tough, talented, ace students, is that right? No, it's just because the teachers in the first grade would be upset and the parents are afraid that the teachers wouldn't treat their children as well as they treat the others who do maths and who already know something. It's easier for the teachers to work with such children who already know something. Well, of course it's easier to when someone has already done your job. It's their job to to teach people to read, to count. I feel yes. your outrage, but I so, think this is, all, this is all about getting an advantage, right? But there's a new idea now. Uh, my uh, younger cousin, he's now in the eighth grade, but when he was small, his father was against uh, all this preschool tutoring. So the boy didn't visit any additional classes and he faced uh, the fact that the teacher was quite upset and mad about him not knowing anything in the first grade. And were there consequences? Well, no. There were no consequences. It's just harder uh, to tell. I, I think it's harder to make the child study in the school if uh, it uh, hadn't hasn't been studied in preschool. You know, it's difficult to do your job. So, of course, she was mad at, at the child. She had to teach him something. Can you believe it? Well, it's no, it's quite a dramatic change. You do nothing in preschool. You play, you sleep and you eat. And then in the first grade, you must study something, basic stuff. But it's just a drastic change. So in order to soften it, parents choose to send their children to such additional classes. Well, it's not that drastic. They're not making you study equations from the get-go. Yeah, but I, I, know what you, I know what you mean. I mean, as far as I, I'm not an expert on preschool school in the UK, but we start school younger. So seven years old, six years old. Uh, so six or seven is when you start school. How many grades school. are there? Well, based on that, there are 12 forms, usually 12 classes that you go through before you graduate. In our case, I think the kindergarten or the preschool is much more about free association, free learning and socializing the, the kids. They don't bother with, they do basic alphabet stuff and counting you know, stuff that's going to help them, I suppose, when they get to the next school. So they're not completely illiterate. But beyond that, they do nothing. So it's mostly painting and, you know, playing with, just socializing generally. I have always considered preschool as a place where people send their kids to be taken care of while they're working. That's a major factor. So yeah, it's not, I don't think its main aim is to teach children and to make geniuses out of them. It's more of taking care of them while their parents cannot do it. This is a feature of modern living, right? That both parents work. So therefore, in days gone by, maybe the one parent earned the money and the other parent looked after the children. But I don't think that's true now. And I think you're right. It's, it's a, it's a in major Russia. factor. They stay, this mother leave lasts for three years. In Vietnam, uh, women stay with the child only for half a year maximum. It's the same in Britain. Three years? What do you do during these three years? Well, you're supposed to raise your child. Well, but the, 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 the fact is that in the UK... But you are degrading while staying at home with the child. You're not contacting with your colleagues, With your, uh, you're yeah. not doing your work, you're not seeing the society. Well, that's maybe a factor in the way Russia is. So, Have you ever taken care of a child? What 
I have. So what kind of abysmal work do you think it is? It is difficult, yes, but saying that you are degradating. No, no, I think I think what, if I may, I think unget means that <clears throat> people lose touch with work and they lose touch with that sort of social circle where you do work. You sort of, you're working somewhere and then you are gone for three years and it's very difficult to get back in. Well, it depends on a yeah. person. Well, I don't know if it does because in Britain we have six months, 12 months and, and a, a paid leave, which the state pays for through the company. It's one year here. Yeah. And here it's one year to pay for it. I think the longer you're out of the workplace, sometimes you can feel you're at a disadvantage. And I know that some employers use it as an excuse not to promote women. Hmm. And I know that's true everywhere, but I think it's particularly true when you, if you know that the person who's pregnant is going to be leaving inside of a few months and you're going to have to find a replacement and that replacement is going to have to work for a year or 18 months, I think as a business, it's going to be more difficult for you to make square that circle. Sure. And I know it's true in the university. A lot of people get pregnant and go on leave. And we have people here who just fill in for those who are not there. And if the department's not big enough, then you're really struggling because there's no way you can fill that work schedule because you know someone's coming back in a year's time, you know. Well, that's the reality of life. It is. What, what should, should we do? Not have kids? Or... Well, that's the point, isn't it? Yeah. I so. mean, there's there's got to be a way of... But there are a lot of teachers graduating every year, so I don't think there are any difficulties finding a, a person to fill in. There's no difficulty doing it, but if, if my career is filling in for everybody else, I never progress. You're listening to Understanding Russia. Well, that was uh, enlightening. Never mind. It's time to hear from a professional. But before you do, I better fact bomb you a little. Preschools are the only educational establishments not controlled by the Ministry of Education, although they do set out basic requirements for literacy and numeracy for older children, which are monitored to ensure that children entering school have at least some knowledge of the means of instruction. Recently, the government has allowed children as young as two months old to enter the preschool system, effectively creating a state-sponsored crash service. This closes the gap between the minimum maternity leave allowance and the minimum age for children to enter preschool. Even so, some parents do not send their children to preschool, only sending them to school at the age of seven. This is common in rural communities where the nearest school may be some tens of kilometers or miles away. Preschool care for the children of urbanites is absolutely the norm, with very few exceptions. Preschool education originated in the Soviet era. Back then, creches and kindergartens were built as part of the natural facilities in any urban development. During the dislocations of the 1990s, many of these old buildings were redeveloped or repurposed, and this means that alternatives must be built, often in less convenient locales. A hangover from the Soviet system is the tangle of red tape that is involved in enrolling your child. This led to a peak in private kindergartens in the 90s and noughties, but a streamlining in administration and the excellence of state-run preschool has seen the numbers of private preschools dwindle away, though they still do exist. Now it is a matter of taste rather than necessity. I happen to live next door to a very lively preschool, and at various times of the day I can, if I am working from home, hear the squealing and shouting that anyone who has experienced groups of the smallest humans will instantly recognize. To me, it is as welcome as birdsong. On my way to work, I often see them playing outside. In the summer, they scurry about in their wide-brimmed hats and congregate around the teachers under the trees in their sizable territory. In the winter, they bounce off the ground and each other, wrapped in so much clothing they resemble quilted beach balls. I have also encountered them on the march, a multicolored, chattering centipede, snaking its way through the streets, destination unknown, at least to me. When night falls, the building continues to radiate the energy of the beings who have temporarily vacated the area. Patches of daubed paper remain glued to the windows, and the forlorn toys half buried in the sandpit wait to be dug up, and coloured ribbons bedeck the lower branches of every tree, guarded by the climbing frames, the slides and the swings. I have to say, I like it. Rather that than a shop. You're listening to Understanding Russia. Our guest today is Elena Mareshko. And she sat down with Dmitry Balanchikov, our interviewer, to educate him on education. She began by explaining the preschool rules. 
This the press code shadow is determined by legislation called sanitary regulations and norms. Health and hygiene regulations govern the daily shadow and welfare requirements for children in preschool educational institutions. They are under the auspices of the chief state sanitary inspector. Typically, preschool is set up for a 12-hour day for general groups, but there are other shadows which depend on the priorities of those groups. For example, there are specialized programs for disadvantaged children, which offer a 10 and a half hour daily stay. There are also short stay groups. These programs offer a three hour stay and education only, no meals are included. About two years ago, the last two 24 hour preschools were closed. Now this type of service is in great demand. Perhaps such preschools will open again in the near future. So does that mean that not all preschools stick to the same schedule? That's right. Every preschool has a right to make up their own daily routine. Center regulations and norms specify only certain moments in the shadow like meals, sleeping time, outdoor time, time for breaks between organized educational activities. We are free to distribute the remain we are free to distribute the remainder according to our specific circumstances. And what are typical preschool hours? They are usually open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Could you please shed some light on the kids' daily routine? They come to preschool, and what do they do? Activities vary from playing, singing, dancing and studying the natural world to experiments, planning things to do, sculpting, drawing and reading. Right from the off? In the morning, the children are met outside. Then they play freely, do their own thing, have breakfast, have some lessons, take a walk, have lunch, and then have their nap. So, if the weather is fine, teachers meet children outside. If the weather allows, they have to meet them outside. Outdoor time is specified in the sanitary regulation and norms. We need to have a total of three to four hours a day. Usually, we do it in chunks. Children play outside for some time in the mornings, after classes, and in the evenings. What about nutrition? We pay a lot of attention to nutrition. Sanitary regulations and norms dictate requirements for the canteen, for the quality of the ingredients, food preparation and portion size. There are more rules for serving and for the presentation of dishes for children that are part of the educational program. The meal cost is not listed separately in the total cost for preschool. The child's maintenance costs a little over 5,000 rubles, about 70 US dollars. Parents pay 100 rubles about a dollar fifty per day with some parents pay 100 rubles about a dollar fifty per day with some compensation returned so a part of the meal cost is reimbursed by the city administration I'm a little confused 5,000 rubles a month it's for the child's maintenance. Actually, parents pay only 2,000 rubles, about $30, plus 20% of this sum goes back into the, their account as reimbursement. That's to say the maintenance of the child in a preschool costs 5,000 rubles. In total, yes. How much does the food account for? The meal cost is not listed separately in the total cost list for preschool. The sum fluctuates. Education is free. The parents pay 2,000 rubles for supervision and maintenance. Meals and utilities are also included in this sum, and the authorities pay for most of the child's preschool fees out of taxation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Can you please describe the difference between public and private preschools in few words? There are different types of private preschools. Some provide only supervision and care services, others have a license to carry out educational activities. In public preschools, there are usually two nursery teachers and one teaching assistant per group. Private preschools are free to set their own staff's schedule. The ratio of teachers to children in private preschools may be different. There may be fewer children per teacher. Private preschools are more parent-oriented. They can hire freelance teachers from various fields. The educational process may also differ. Private preschools have the right to make up their own rules. The meals can be different. They can take into account the parents' and children's preferences and introduce gluten-free meals, for example. It is now really possible in public preschools due to the way they are funded. By the way, reimbursement is also given to parents who attend private preschools in Belgrade. It is unique to Belgrade, as far as I know. Am I right in thinking that there are more public preschools than private ones? A lot more, of course. Is it true for the whole country? Absolutely. You also said the public preschools have two nursery teachers and one teaching assistant on average per group. 
That's right. Could you please explain the difference between nursery teachers and teaching assistants? A teacher organizes the educational process, interacts with parents and other daycare workers. An assistant keeps order, feeds the children, washes dishes, helps dress and undress the children and escorts them to the bathroom if they are too young to do it themselves. Is admission process in public preschools complicated? It is easier now than it was. There are almost no waiting lists for preschools thanks to the authorities' efforts. All you need is to be registered to a household in the city where you want to send your child to school. How many children can there be in one group at most? Sanitary regulations and norms also set our requirements for the number of children in one preschool group. There is an area standard per child, which is two and a half square meters for nursery and preschool children and two meters for pre-kindergarten children. These norms are useful to form the list of group members. These norms are used to form the list of group members. How many is it on average? Approximately 25 children, maybe less, maybe more, but the average number is 25. It's not the same in every preschool. There are preschools that are located in more densely populated areas they are more in demand. Perhaps there will be a larger number of children in the group. Could you tell us something about kids' sleep times? They do need a nap, right? Naturally, there is a two and a quarter hour nap time approved in sanitary regulations and norms. The time depends on the age, and there are also groups with no nap time. And the kids don't fight it. I hated preschool naps. What's it like now? No, well, it depends. Some children can't stop nap times. Modern requirements allow them not to sleep if they don't want to. If circumstances allow them to engage in some other activities, then they will not have to sleep. What other activities? White play or other things a child likes to do. What kind of facilities are there for outdoor play? Every group has its own yard, a playground with sand pits, sports equipment and toys. And what type of hobby groups or classes are there, which are the most popular? Lists of hobby groups are made according to the parents' preferences and the preschool's ability to provide them. There are different types of hobby groups – English classes, swimming classes, visual arts classes, and so on, as long as these activities are outside the scope of the educational program. You mean there are mandatory and optional hobby groups? No, there are no mandatory hobby groups, only optional ones that suit the taste of the children and their parents. Are English classes in demand? Yes, on a fee basis, as an additional to the main subjects. You're listening to Understanding Russia. <clears throat> Allow me to go off topic a little bit. My current activity is related to foreign languages. My major is translation and interpretation. In preschool, I also had the opportunity to study English. But to be honest, I and a lot of my peers could not start English lessons. They sent chills down my spine. I took every opportunity to skip them. Even in school, I couldn't generate any enthusiasm for it for the first few years until my parents decided to send me to a private language school. Do you think that children like learning English nowadays? I think that it depends on the teacher. A motivated teacher is crucial to a successful classroom. Motivation also helps to drive creativity and curiosity, sparking the desire needed for students to want to learn more. So English teachers are not on the preschool staff, as I understand, are they? No, they aren't. They were on the staff until three years ago. About 30 preschools participated in a government-sponsored scheme. At that time, they had foreign language teachers on the staff, but with the introduction of the standard, those positions were taken away. There are a lot of preschools and kindergartens in every city in Russia, so obviously there are a vast majority of childcare workers. As we know, there is a professional recognition day for each profession. Do preschool workers have their own professional holiday? Yes. Since 2004, our country has celebrated National Child Care Provider Day. The first preschool in St. Petersburg was opened on the 27th of September in 1863, so this date has been chosen as a professional holiday for all preschool workers. And how is this National Child Care Provider Day usually celebrated? Traditionally, the city administration puts on concerts, performances and events and presents professional awards. And do parents give the teachers gifts? Yes, of course. This holiday is celebrated throughout the country, so parents bring flowers and make pretty speeches. And bring sweets? Yes, there are also sweets. Russians love their sweets, that's for sure. What do you think is the most important thing for children in preschool? The most important thing is comfort in every sense of the word. If the environment is comfortable, the child will be eager to go to school. Do you think children like preschools in general? 
It depends on the teachers. The 2020, everyone has a smartphone. I work in a school. Every student there has a phone, but they need to put them in a special box before class. The teachers give them back to the kids after the class, of course. Could you tell us, please, do children take smartphones to preschool? No, they don't. At least, not in my experience. And the teacher is not responsible for their jewelry, phones and other expensive things. There are notices for just such occasions. They state that the teacher is not responsible for the safety of personal effects. Do children steal anything from each other? In my experience, no. Maybe only some small things. Well, what can a child steal from another child? Almost every toy belongs to the school. If a child brings his own toy, it's almost always something small. There haven't been any serious situations regarding stealing. I used to steal in preschool. I once stole a toy strongman that I really liked. More than that, once I took someone else's coloring book and spoiled it, I was severely punished for this misdeed. What do you think if a teacher saw this kind of behavior? How would they react? We would try to impress on you why this is bad. I don't think that any harsh punishment would follow. For the record, it was my parents who did the punishing. No one punished me in school, of course. It's not something that happens, right? No. On toys, is there some kind of a list, a set of toys for each group? There are no special lists for toys. There are no special lists for toys. We purchase toys for role-playing games, didactic games and books. So do children bring their own toys? We don't count the toys children bring. There is a special developmental zone in each school that is regularly replenished. Special money is allocated to this end. It's not much, but it's enough to buy more toys from time to time. As well as that, the teachers actually make a lot of things that will be used for educational purposes. They try to enhance the play area with their own handicraft skills. So toys can be made by teachers themselves, bought for the preschool and brought in by the children, right? Children bring their toys occasionally. What toys are children into now? Toys nowadays tend to be more sophisticated. A lot of toys are made of building blocks. That means toys are often connected to computers and they move. Technological progress has affected preschool as well. I'm 21 and I remember that our toys were quite simple. Are you saying that toys have become more interesting now? Yes, much more. Visit us and you'll see for yourself. <laughs> I think it would require much more sophisticated toys than you have available. How many years have you worked in preschool? About 30, I guess. I can't say for sure, but 30, I think. What kind of education did you have? Actually, by training. I'm a math teacher. Wow. It just happened that way. And did you start working in preschool right after university? No, there were other jobs. I started working in preschool after I had kids. I had to return to work after maternity leave and send them to preschool. So you decided to combine your maternal duties and your job? I went to preschool with my children because I thought it would be better if I was around. I never left. You really killed two birds with one stone. Yes. But was it the only reason you started working in preschool? You just needed daycare for your children and you didn't have any specific ideas like I want to help the children, I want to take care of them. No, I didn't think about it that kind of thing when I was young. Neither did I. Although I have wonderful memories of my preschool, I never thought that I would work in one. Do you remember the year when you started working in preschool? 1985, I think. Was it in Belgrade? Yes. My daughter was a year and a half old when we went to daycare. Which kind of daycare? It has long since been demolished. It was a small free group preschool. That's where it all started, I suppose. You are now a senior nursery teacher at kindergarten number 78. Could you tell us what you do there? My duties include organizing the programs, guiding nursery teachers and other educators and specialists in their methodology, actually anyone who works in kindergarten, well, the teaching staff anyway. So the nursery teachers take care of children, and the senior teacher takes care of… Of the nursery teachers, yes. 
Have you had any negative experiences in your work? There have been some, of course. For example, when my colleagues take part in some contests or competitions without success, I tend to think this is my fault, because we didn't think everything through. There have been negative experiences, for sure. In addition, there may be an inspection that point out our weak points. If we undergo official supervision called control, yes, sometimes I did think that something went wrong somewhere because of me. There have been negative experiences, for sure. You're listening to Understanding Russia. What kind of competitions? Tell us about the contests that your nursery teachers take part in. There are, in fact, a lot of them. What is evaluated? Professional skills, who present projects, hold open days. All this is assessed by a qualified jury. And have you been supervising nursery teachers since you became a senior teacher? Sure. If they take part in such contests, it is the senior teacher's responsibility to prepare them for a competition. What's the greatest achievement in your career to date? Well, I have received some national awards, a certificate and award from the Ministry of Education for Excellence in Public Education, but I don't consider these as achievements. For me, it's more important to complete something interesting and meaningful. When you are passionate about it, put all your effort in it and end up with something that is in demand and meaningful for the children, I consider that to be a professional achievement. It is not meant to satisfy my personal ambitions, but to satisfy certain needs of children. Do you love your job? Of course I do. I heard that as a senior teacher, you're a renowned person in Belgrade. I heard that you give lectures. Sometimes we have to, because our press school is a traineeship site of the Belgrade Regional Institute of Professional Development. Its specialists involve us in their work, especially now, when access to kindergartens is closed due to the pandemic, we have to reach out to the trainees. You don't give lectures offline now, but online, do you? Really, because I'm usually asked to give lectures in courses for senior nursery teachers, and these courses don't happen that often. There are more teachers than seniors, there are more teachers than senior teachers, so the courses are less frequent. Do you hold webinars? Sometimes we get involved in webinars as well. Well, what about those? In those same events we mentioned before. You prepare your question, and that's it, then you speak. What do you usually talk about? Well, we all belong to regional teaching association, where you have to look at some checklists, make summaries and present them. Recently, we did an assessment of programs for preschool consultation centers. I was a speaker on that as well. Right now, we are preparing a webinar on early preschool years, where we are going to talk about planning for young children. There are many different topics, really. Do you keep in touch with your preschool graduates? If you consider nursery teachers as graduates, then yes. I spend more time as a senior teacher than as a teacher. My former colleagues call me and ask questions. We talk to each other if we need anything. But keeping in touch with children, well, I worked as a nursery teacher a long time ago, so none that I can think of. Not a single one? Well, maybe with one. My senior nursery teacher, who supervised me when I was a teacher, used to bring her child to my group. So with her, yes, we occasionally meet. But she's no longer a child. She's an adult woman with children of her own. I see her, yes, but she's more like a daughter to me, really. How has your occupation helped you in bringing up your own children? Has it helped at all? I don't think it did, because when my children were growing up, I didn't think about methodology at all. I wasn't conscious of it, really. I just tried to be there for them, to help them, to support them. I knew all their friends. Their friends came around to our house all the time. I didn't follow any particular rules. I had no such plans. You're a grandmother now? Yes, I have a granddaughter. A granddaughter? Only one? Only one. You don't use all these methods with her either. I do not have the opportunity because she has her own parents and she is with them most of the time and we don't live together. I'm kind of a visiting grandmother. I'll buy her an educational toy, give advice to her parents and offer them some important books on parenting. That's how my relationship with my granddaughter is developing to this point. And what was the last toy you bought her? Last time I gave her a construction set. What type of construction set? Her very first, probably, large Lego to build a tower. And then, of course, I bought her some traditional toys. She's small, just over a year old, so she needs toys appropriate to her age. A roly-poly toy, a whipping top, a pyramid. What would you like your granddaughter to be? 
When she was a year old, we did an experiment following the popular tradition. We sat her down on a fur coat and put a lot of objects in front of her. She chose car keys. <laughs> Do you think she's going to be a taxi driver? Maybe. Or perhaps a technician. Her dad involves her in assembling furniture all the time. The other day they made a bird feeder and now they feed the birds. She's drawn to technology. I think she will be involved in something mechanical. What's her least positive character trait? I do not think I am strict enough with my stuff. I do not like doing things that do not interest me. I do not like fixing other people's mistakes. I mean, I would rather redo it myself. This is probably a negative trait because people learn from their mistakes. But I really hate picking up after someone else. I just do not like fixing other people's mistakes. And what are your most positive qualities? I tend to trust my intuition. Does it work? Yes. It does. I like doing interesting things and I'm willing to sacrifice a lot for them. Time and money just to achieve the result I want. What else? I also hate conflicts. I always try to solve problems peacefully. These qualities are related to each other. You are not strict and you do not like conflicts. I dislike conflicts. This is probably a good thing. I like not forcing people to do things. I like it when a person is enthusiastic about an idea without being forced. I think nothing should be done by force. You should want to do it. What is your dream? Currently, I want the quarantine measures to be over as soon as possible so that everything can go back to normal, masks off, people gathering together, and so on. When this is over, I'll dream about something else, but right now my dream is just that. I want everyone to be healthy, colleagues, relatives, children, and friends, and for these difficult times to come to an end as soon as possible. By the way, daycare institutions have been working the whole time. They have. We are part of the service sector, so we do not have any choice. Parents work. There are parents who work in certain industries that cannot be shut down, so ours can't be shut down either. What wishes do you have for yourself? Health and patience. I also wish you health and patience. Thanks for the chat. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Understanding Russia. If you want to contact us, you can get in touch with us via our website at urpod.net, where you can find all our social media links, or via email, understandingrussia at gmail.com. We will be very happy to hear from you. You have been listening to Understanding Russia, a student-led podcast from Belgorod State University.